Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Clark. I am an associate professor at the University of California at Riverside. And today I'm going to present uh, some of the research that I've done along with some of my students uh, in the past few years. Uh, in my talk, The Littlest Birds Sing the Prettiest Songs, Song Learning and Portrait Displays of Hummingbirds. So uh, my research is about how hummingbirds make sounds. And I often get asked, or, or, or people are often surprised when they hear that, that some hummingbirds uh, do sing. And so I'm going to start off by telling you about some of the research that uh, I and, and my students have done on how hummingbirds sing. So of course, I'm, I'm doing this uh, video presentation for you guys over there in, in Texas, um, <coughs> in the Davis Mountains. Um, and so, of course, you're, you're very familiar with, with deserts over there in Texas because you've got one of the great North American deserts right there in your state. Uh, the species that I'm going to talk about right now uh, is not found in Texas. It's instead found out here in, in California in the Mojave Desert. So this is a male Costas hummingbird. Um, they're not found only in the Mojave Desert. They're also found out here to the, the, the coast uh, and all the way down Baja, California. But basically, uh, when you come to California or Arizona, like the quintessential example of a, of a hummingbird that's found in the desert is Costa's hummingbird. So, and you guys over there in Texas, you do have uh, Ocotillo. And so some of the ecosystems where you find Costa's hummingbirds are very similar to the Chihuahuan desert of, of Texas. So this right here, this is a, a picture of typical habitat where you find a Costa's hummingbird. And during the spring, when the ocotillos are in leaf and uh, in bloom, that's when the, the cost of hummingbirds breed. And so in a spot like this, supposing a male had a territory, um, hummingbirds, uh, male hummingbirds that set up territories, what they do is they, um, they, they find a tall perch in an area where they are hoping that females will come by. And then they set up, uh, they basically, they spend a lot of their time sitting on this perch, uh, watching for the area, looking, looking to see if a female will come by. Now, male hummingbirds don't help the females raise the offspring. She, you know, the male leaves the female to do all of that by herself. Uh, and so, yeah, so here's a picture of a male Costas hummingbird sitting on the very tip top of an ocotillo on the lookout. So because the males don't actually help the females raise the offspring, what that leads to is that females have to pick which male they want to mate with, and they're not really going to get, he's not good for anything. He's not, the female is not going to get anything from him except some sperm. And so what that means is that like, like in other animals that have similar mating systems, what that means is that female hummingbirds have exacting preferences for what it is that they want in a mate. And when that happens, uh, when, when female preferences play an important role in, in the mating system of a species, what tends to then happen is that male males evolve ornaments. So here we have a female, you can see she's got a white throat, she does not have any of these bright purple iridescent feathers that this male has. And that's, that's because the male is gonna use these, these feathers in the process of trying to court the female. The male, in addition to spreading his throat feathers and getting right up in the female's face when he's courting her, uh, he also has uh, a, a dive that he does where he'll send about 25 or so uh, yards in the air and then swoop past the female at high speed. I'll show some videos of that in a little bit. And in addition, he also sings a vocal song. So, and I should uh, apologize in advance. Uh, sometimes as you get older, some people have uh, hearing loss and especially some people lose their high frequency hearing. If you are somebody like that, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to hear these sound recordings because they're extremely high pitched. Uh, but anyway, here's one of the sounds that he makes. So that was a short, uh, that was about two seconds long. That was a short song. It ascended in pitch. There was a little blip in the middle and then it descended in pitch. Here's the sound that he makes with his tail feathers when he dives. And although those two sounds were not exactly the same, they were very similar to each other. And so the, the origin of the project that I'm gonna tell you about next comes from the fact that the song, and again, this is the song, and it's, it's, it's obviously vocal. The male sits on a perch, he's moving his lips while he, while he makes it. That sound, that's vocal, is very similar to this sound. That's the dive sound. And for those of you that know how to read spectrograms, this is a spectrogram of the song right here. This is a spectrogram of the dive. 
And apart from this little blip in the middle that's in the song and not in the dive sound, you'll notice that pretty much every other feature about those two sounds is very similar. Also, I'm not going to talk about Anna's hummingbird today, but I will, other than mentioning that Anna's hummingbird is the sister species to Costa's hummingbird. Anna's hummingbird is a quintessential kind of California hummingbird. Uh, and part of its song sounds like this, which is a close match to the, their dive sound, which sounds like this. Beep. And so what we have is, again, a part of the song from Anna Summingbird matches uh, the dive sound. And the song and dive sound is, of Anna Summingbird don't closely resemble the song and dive sound of Costa Summingbird. So what that tells us is that Costa Summingbird has evolved this song very specifically and this dive sound very, very specifically. OK, so I set out to understand why does Costa Summingbird make similar sounds in two very different ways. So again, he makes this sound. Uh, with his beak and he make, or his throat, uh, and he makes this sound with his tail feathers. So once again, that was the song, and here's the tail feather sound. And I, I should be upfront right now. Uh, I set this up as a why question. Why does Costa Summingbird do this? I actually don't have an answer. Uh, but instead, the next set of experiments that I'm going to tell you about are things that inch us a little bit closer to getting an answer to this question. So first, I'm going to talk about the song. And specifically, this is a, the project that I'm going to describe next was my student Katie Johnson's uh, PhD dissertation. And what this was is that when she arrived in my lab, I had several different ideas for possible projects for a PhD. And I mentioned this one on, oh, you know, we could try some song learning experiments. Nobody knows anything about how hummingbirds learn their songs. I didn't try to, try to sell this project on her very hard. Uh, but instead, she's the one that, that when she heard about it, she gravitated towards it. So what, what song learning is, is this is the idea that a young animal hears uh, an adult of its own species sing some sort of vocalization. And as a result of being exposed to the song when, at a young age, when it's an adult, it then in turn sings the same song. I'm doing that right now. I'm speaking English. Uh, humans have song learning or, or vocal learning uh, rather uh, where I'm speaking English because that's what my, what my parents exposed me to when I was young. And all of you are understanding English because at some earlier point in your life, you also were exposed to English. And this is, uh, human speech is unusual in that respect. Most mammals don't do that, but we do. And this process takes place in songbirds, things like sparrows or finches. And so it's been studied a whole lot in uh, zebra finches and uh, white crowned sparrows and the like. But Within birds, hummingbirds are very distantly related to the passerine birds. And we knew at the outset of this, when Katie started her, her PhD, we knew virtually nothing about how this process actually takes place in a hummingbird. So the procedure was that Katie and some other people in my lab went out to find nests. So here's a nest with a couple of baby costas hummingbirds. These guys are pretty close to fledging, but they're not quite ready. And we would then uh, take them into captivity and raise them in these cages that were uh, inside the, of isolation chambers. And the reason for the isolation is that if you raise the, a baby hummingbird in isolation where it never hears the sound of its own species, uh, you can be sure that if whatever sounds it produces, it produced uh, because of, of what it was exposed to earlier in life. So the baby hummingbird that she's taken into captivity right, is right there. And it says something about syringes because that's, we use these syringes as a way, of, it's an artificial flower. It's that, that's what the, the baby hummingbirds are being fed. And then these orange circles are, are circling things like a camera to monitor its behavior and a microphone to record all the sounds that it makes. And so what Katie, she did a series of experiments. And uh, one of the experiments was to play different, different babies in different isolation chambers, different versions of Costa's hummingbird song. So this is a spectrogram of a regular Costa Summingbird song, and so is this one. So two birds got this treatment. Here is the results where you get a baby hummingbird that's basically singing the song of its own species. This one, well, anyway. Uh, here's another one where Katie only played the first half of the song to the baby, and here's the result, that the baby was singing just the first half of the song. Here's one, so the songs actually sound pretty similar forwards and backwards. So here's one where she played the song uh, backwards, where these click, these, these, these lines are the second half of the song rather than the first half. And here's the baby hummingbird singing exactly that with these clicks in the back half. Here's one where she played the tail sound to the birds, uh, the dive sound. And so here's a baby hummingbird singing the dive sound. I'll, I'll play an example of that in just a minute. 
And then we did have a control. Uh, our control treatment was to, was to play Anna's hummingbird song to uh, the baby Costa's hummingbirds. And when Katie did that, they sang this. So what this is, this is the bird going, do, 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 do. Several birds sang this song, a series of down sweeps. And uh, the, the one common feature that they had is that they had not learned to sing the song. So if we expose a Costa's hummingbird to an Anna's hummingbird, song, uh, they don't learn Anna song a good song. They, they, their brains are programmed to learn their own species song and not the song of a different close relative species. Let's see, oh, that's right. And I said I'd play a song. So here's the dive sound. Here's what they actually sound like in the wild. And here's one of Katie's baby Costas hummingbirds singing the dive sound. Okay, so Katie's uh, experimental results, a really simple one. She verified that Costas hummingbird is a species that learns its songs. Uh, she found that what, what's called the sensory period and the sensory motor period overlap. And what that means is that, that the development of the song in hummingbirds is similar to how zebra finches learn their song and not to how some sparrows learn their song. So what this means is that the baby is still listening to sounds of adults of its own species while it starts to babble and produce its own vocalizations and then try to match those vocalizations to what it has in its head. Another result that she had is that when she piped just sound into her box, the baby hummingbirds did not learn the sound that she played them. Instead, what she had to do is she had to put a, an adult male of their species, an adult male Costa's hummingbird, into the box with the baby and that would trigger the baby to learn the song. Uh, they have what's called open-ended song learning. And this is, this is, it's sort of like as humans that you can learn another language when you're an adult. Uh, it's basically some birds can keep changing their song even when they're adults and other birds can't. And it turns out that hummingbirds are an example of a species that can change their song as an adult. Let's see, I already said this one that uh, baby hummingbirds raised with Anna's hummingbird song don't learn Anna's hummingbird song. Now, Costa's hummingbird and Anna's hummingbird hybridize occasionally. I'm, uh, I live in Riverside, California, and uh, we're kind of, this is the, Riverside is kind of the very middle of the place where both Anna's and Costa's are really common. And so we find hybrids between the two species quite frequently, like se several of them per year. Um, what we think is going on is that baby, or Costa's hummingbirds don't learn the song of Anna's hummingbird as a way of uh, helping keeping the species separate. They, that each species has a preference for learning uh, its, own, its own species song. And then uh, we also found that very subtle features of the song are matched by the babies, suggesting that they do have sharp perceptual abilities. Um, it's really clear that hummingbirds have remarkable hearing. Uh, many birds can't hear very well above about eight kilohertz. Uh, and I, I didn't label the axes on these graphs, but this little blip of sound right here is almost 11 kilohertz. And here's the baby hummingbird singing the same thing. Uh, so it seems that hummingbirds have uh, an expanded hearing range. Something is going on with their ears that's different from other birds, and we just don't understand it very well yet. Okay, so the question that I open with is, why does Costa's hummingbird make these two different sounds two different ways? Well, what I can say from the results that I just presented so far is that we know that, so this is the vocalization, the song, we know that many features within this uh, are sung very specifically because if we if we change the, the features of the song, uh, the baby hummingbirds would, would, are able to and do sing something different. Okay, so what about the tail feathers? So I mentioned a little bit ago that Costas hummingbirds, the males, uh, perform this this dive where they fly up about 25 or 30 yards in the air and then they swoop at high speed past the female. And what Costas hummingbirds Costas hummingbirds are really fun when they dive because they do left-handed dives and right-handed dives. So if the female is down here, the male first dives on one side of the female, then he comes up and dives on the other side of the female and he alternates back and forth doing diving on one side of her and then diving on the other back and forth and back and forth. And what, when they do this, they, they make sounds with their outer tail feathers. So this thin feather right here is R5. R5 is really narrow. R, R5 is about two millimeters wide. And what's happening is that when air flows across the feather, the back edge of the feather is vibrating. And just like a thin guitar string makes high frequency sound, uh, this really thin feather produces a really high frequency sound in Costa's hummingbird. To scale, this is what an Anna's hummingbird tail feather looks like 
The Anna's hummingbird feather is about twice the width and it produces about half the pitch or half the frequency of a Costa's feather. So just like, you know, think of this as a thick guitar string that produces a low frequency sound. And this is a thin guitar string that produces a high frequency sound. Okay. So there's a sound, uh, a sound, a sound, um, a uh, sound effect that is really widespread in, especially in cartoons from like the 70s and 80s, and it's this. And in fact, probably many or most, if not all of you, recognize that sound as like the, 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 the uh, airplane sound effect in cartoons. Well, the origin of that sound effect was not just any airplane. It specifically was the Stuka dive bomber, which is a, was a German aircraft in World War II. So dive bombing was, was, the, uh, was the way of, of doing precision bombing back uh, during that war. And what would happen is that a dive bomber would fly along at fairly low elevation. And when it spotted a, a target on the ground, it would do a roll. And so it was then diving straight down. It would aim and drop its munitions, and then it would pull up at the bottom of the dive uh, and then fly and then fly back to base to, to reload with, with another bomb. And so what would happen is that as the dive bomber went into the dive, it would speed up and be going really fast. And then here at the bottom of the dive, when it's pulling up out of the dive, that's when it would hit really high G-forces and the pilot would sometimes black out. And, and fortunately for the pilot, these, these airplanes could fly themselves for a good 20 or 30 seconds. And as if, you know, if you're uh, Polish troops on the ground, if this, if, as if having a, an airplane drop out of the sky to drop a bomb right on top of you wasn't frightening enough. Uh, what the Germans did is they attached a siren to the bottom of the aircraft. And so the way that the siren works is that the faster the aircraft flies, the faster these blades spin. And it's the, and it's the blade passage frequency of those blades that, that produces the pitch of sound that's, that's produced. So what you're hearing right here, That, that drop in pitch uh, is the sound of the Stuka dive bomber pulling out of its dive. So what's happening, so, so just to repeat, what's happening is that the faster the dive bomber goes, the higher pitch the sound. And in that respect, because it's, this is a sound being produced by an aircraft that's diving, where the sound is a product of how fast it goes, it's very similar to the sound of Costa's hummingbird. Okay, so uh, Emily Mystic and I set out to understand more about how this sound is made in Costa's hummingbird. And so in my lab, I have a wind tunnel uh, to test things like how feathers make sound. And so specifically, the, the wind tunnel is an open jet. So basically, this white thing right here, this is just the air emptying in a massive jet into the open space of my lab. Here's a Costa's hummingbird feather. And then all these red points are points around the feather that we measured the sound with uh, some microphones. And so when Emily put the feathers in my wind tunnel, she found that, uh, we already knew this, but we, she was able to quantify it much better, that the faster the airspeed goes, and I should say for, for those of you, know, I assume almost everybody here is uh, more familiar with miles per hour than meters per second, 15 meters per second uh, is about 30 miles per hour. Uh, anyway, the faster the airspeed goes, the, the louder the sound made by the tail feathers. Uh, another one, this is really basic, uh, the further away from the feathers that we were, the quieter the sound. So this is, I mean, everybody's familiar with this, that a sound source that's close to you makes, is louder than a sound source that's far away from you. Uh, we did some experiments and were able to show that the feather called R4, so the second outermost tail feather, it actually amplifies the sound by about 11 or 12 decibels. Uh, so here's R5 by itself. Here's R5 with an aluminum flat plate behind it. There's no difference there. Uh, but if you put R4, which is not a flat plate, it's, it's flat, but it can, it can vibrate unlike the plate, uh, it amplifies the sound by about 11 decibels. Uh, by measuring in all these points around the feather, we could show that the sound is really directional. So the feather is vibrating, it's basically doing this, and that beams sound on, axis with the, on the axis of the vibration. And the effect here is also about 11 or 12 decibels. The XY plane around the feather is about 12 decibels quieter than the Z axis of the feather. And then finally, this is the Stuka, uh, Stuka dive bomber effect. The faster the airspeed, the higher the pitch of the sound. So when the, when, in the wind tunnel, when the, when the feathers are going about uh, 14 meters per second, they're here at about seven uh, kilohertz. And that sound rises to nine kilohertz by the time they're going 24 meters per second. So just to summarize what these graphs show, the loudness of the sound rises with speed, falls with distance, 
It's boosted by the presence of tail feather R4, and it's highly directional. And the frequency, the graph E shows that the frequency of the sound rises with speed. Uh, and there's also the Doppler effect. I have not addressed the Doppler effect with these, these graphs. OK, so what we did, once we once we'd measured the feathers in the wind tunnel and, uh, and better characterized how they make sound, we then made a couple of models. And to test those models, we went out to record actual cost of hummingbirds diving out in the wild. So what we have here, there's a female in a cage. Right, that little fuzzy thing right there is a microphone to hear the sound as the female hears it. Here's another microphone, another two other microphones. Um, and then we have these two things, AC1 and AC2 are acoustic cameras. And so that's, I mean, what's happened here, that's my backpack. I literally, uh, there's the laptop to run this acoustic camera. And I've just run up on a hillside to snap this photo. And Emily is patiently waiting for me next to her acoustic camera. And so what these acoustic cameras are, they are a, an actual camera in the middle of an array. And then all these other dots are microphones in a kind of spiraled array around the real camera. And the acoustic camera works just like your ears do, where sound coming in comes to one ear before the other. And so you can tell the sound is coming from the right because it hits your, your right ear first. Well, the acoustic camera does the same thing. Sound arrives at one microphone slightly before another one. And it can use that very subtle difference in timing to tell where the sound is coming from. OK, and so what we did is we got acoustic camera video where the software is then painting colors onto the video to show where the sound is coming from. So here's the, here's the, the female in the cage. This is two dives that Acosta Summingbird did, one of those right-handed dives and then a left-handed dive over the, over the female. All right, here's the video. OK, and so the reason, oops, let me go back. So the reason why the swoosh is staying there, it's basically like I've, I've left the, the aperture of the camera open. And so that you can think of this, this image as like a long exposure to what, what sound is where. Uh, but here's another video. This is the type of video we actually digitized. So this is two cameras, same bird. Uh, and the female is down here in this bush, which is here and here. And you can't actually see her. OK, so you get the idea. So this is a male diving over and over again over the female. OK, so the model that we made, uh, the way to think about this, so the, the male, as he dives, he dives past the female uh, following this, this, this kind of curving trajectory. And what we wanted to know, what was really funny about this species, unlike any other hummingbird, uh, is that the males dive not straight over the top of the female, but rather they dive off to her side. And so that's the, what the males actually do is this green trajectory right here. And so for the following model, the gray line represents the male actually passing, literally passing through the female. Uh, purple, unfortunately, we couldn't actually include this in the model very much, but I'll show it here. Purple would be the male diving at, at greater heights above the female. And then the red lines I'm going to show, or the blue lines I'm going to show, are the male diving in front of the female, and the red lines are the male diving behind the female. And so basically, the purpose of this model is try to understand why is it that the, what what how does diving off to the side affect the sound that the female hears? And so the Doppler effect is caused by the motion of the source relative to the receiver, and the motion of the source of the male relative to the receiver it's it's a function of his velocity, this this v male. Um, Variable. And it's also a function of this angle theta. So any of you that have stood on the side of the street and heard a car coming towards you uh, knows that, that when the car goes past you and this angle theta changes, that's when the pitch of, this, of the car drops. And then I'm going to refer to the CPA, the closest point of approach in, in later um, parts of the slide. And then D, this is the distance of the male as he goes by the female at this closest point of approach. So the velocity profile of the male is that early in the dive, he's speeding up. And the speed rises. And then later in the dive, his speed falls. And so I simply took this one velocity profile as a, a typical one. And what we find is that if, if I take the, the velocity profile and the trajectory, and I then move that trajectory around the female, what happens is this angle theta changes at different times. So when the male dives behind the female, 
Theta goes from a low angle up through 90 to a high angle pretty early in the dive. So this point where it passes 90 is, is the earliest point here. If the male dives in front of the female, he does most of the dive when he's still at a low angle relative to the female and theta uh, changes really late in the dive. And if he dives off to her side, uh, this green line passes 90 in between where it would if in the red curve and where it does in the blue curve, but also the angle of the line is much lower. The slope is, is lower if he dives off to her side. And so if we put these effects together, this black line, this is the, the sound the male hears himself make. Where early in the dive, the sound rises because he's increasing in speed. And then later in the dive, the sound falls because he's decreasing in speed. And then the difference between this black line and these other three lines, that's the Doppler effect. So early in the dive, anywhere, anywhere that where the male might be diving, he's moving towards the female and the sound is shifted up as the female hears it compared to what the male hears. But because this angle changes early in the red curves, it drops early here. Uh, and so late in the dive, the female would hear a lower pitch than the male hears himself make. Here's the blue curve where the, the, the uh, drop in pitch at the end of the dive is the steepest. And then here's the green curve that represents what the male actually does. <coughs> so then we, so, okay, so this is what our model said should happen. Uh, and then we wanted to know, well, okay, what, if we get some sound recordings from microphones, uh, what actually does happen? And so this is an example, this is uh, seven dives that the male did that we digitized, where you can see he's doing the odd dives on one side of the female and the even dives on the other. On uh, the red dots, we're at a kind of funny angle here in this, in this reconstruction of the dives. The red dots are where he was closest to the female. And so by luck, we got a, few, some, a handful of dives where uh, the position of the microphones more or less matched how we had modeled the sound. So in the, in the real world, the, when the male dove to the female, he was about 4.5 meters off to her side. And so these are three different sound recordings of the exact same dive sound, but from these different positions. And what we see, so the model predicted that the red curve would drop the earliest. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. We get an earlier drop in the red curve. The model predicted that the, the, the drop in frequency throughout the, the end of the dive would be the shallowest in the green curve, in the, gre the green position. And that's what we find. And then in, uh, for the, the microphone position uh, where he's dive, that, that represents the male diving in front of the female, we predict that it'd be a, a stop or a steep drop in pitch late in the, the dive sound. In fact, that's exactly what we find right here. So what these data did is they, con they confirmed that, or, or they, they, the data plus the model showed that this strategy of diving off to the side that cost us something actually employ what it has the effect of doing is it hides the Doppler shift. The Doppler shift is harder for the female to hear when the male is diving off to her side than any other position that he might dive in. Okay, so the strategy of diving off to her side is a little bit funny because it might make him harder to hear. And the reason why I say that is because I've studied the displays of a bunch of other hummingbirds and all of the other species spread their tails when. Uh, out to either side and fly right over the top of the female. So this is an Anna's hummingbird. The Anna's passes right over the top of the female. This is a black gin hummingbird. Black gins pass right over the top of the female. And in each of these, you can see they've got their tail spread out to either side. This is a, uh, an oasis hummingbird from Chile. This is a, uh, uh, a um, purple collared wood star from, from Ecuador. And this is a little wood star from Ecuador. And again, in each of these guys, they're spreading both sides of their tail. And what I showed several slides ago was that the, the sounds are very directional. So what these guys should all be doing is they should be beaming the sound below them when they spread their tail in this way. And so to understand if that's what Costa hummingbirds were doing, we went to the botanical gardens at UC Riverside and got some high-speed video of their dives. Here's one of the videos. So this is me trying to follow the bird as it dives. Okay, that was somewhat hard to see. So here's some still images from that video. What you can see, the camera was off to the side of the male uh, and you can see that because he's got both here's his wings down and here's his wings up. And the funny thing that was going on in, in the males that we got videos of is that you could see they twisted their tail. Also, you can't really tell it from this camera angle, but it turned out the males were only spreading half their tail when they were diving. And so we hypothesize what's going on is that by twisting their tail, they're beaming the sound out to either side um, of them. And so to test that hypothesis, Again, like before, we made a model, but this time the model was about the sound pressure level. So what Emily has done when she made this model, the black line, it represents the trajectory of the male. 
And the, the colors in the XY plane that include where the female is, is the modeled loudness. So this is where we've used the actual data we collected from the feathers to model what is the effect of, <coughs> oh, excuse me. What is the effect of the male twisting his tail? And you can see that because the sounds of the tail feathers are directional, there actually is a fairly pronounced effect of the male twisting his tail. There's this lobe of yellow here and lobe of yellow here that represents louder sound. And this is assuming the male's twisted his tail a full 90 degrees. Okay, so to test this model, what we did is we went to, uh, uh, we went and recorded a bunch of male uh, Costas hummingbirds diving. And then we used the acoustic camera videos to estimate both how far was the male from the camera uh, over the course of the dive and how loud was he. And so because we knew the distance, we could control for distance. And so what happens, we measure the, the position of, of the camera relative to this angle uh, gamma, which is this angle of was the male diving straight towards the camera or was he diving to the side of the camera? And what you can see from this red line, if the male is diving straight towards the camera, uh, the dive was on average about uh, eight or nine decibels quieter than if he was diving, diving at a 90 degree angle to the camera. And you can see, the, see that in these two video clips. So these, these, this, um, these are simultaneous uh, recordings. It's the same dive, it's from two different orientations. Uh, this one represents this green star right here, and this one represents this red star right here. So what's going on is that this camera is filming from the side of the dive, uh, and we're, we're further away from the male right here. We're 19 meters away from the male in this video, but he's louder. Here, we're actually physically closer to the male, but there's not as much sound, and that's because the angle is, is lower. So what, these, what, what the acoustic camera videos of the males diving did is they showed that, yes, uh, this model that we met, made does uh, more or less explain what, what's going on, that by twisting the ta his tail, the male was able to beam the sound sideways uh, towards the female, and that this, this compensates for the fact that he's chosen to dive um, off to the side of the female rather than over the top of her, the way that most other hummingbirds do. Okay, so in, in this particular project, I still have a mystery. Why do males spread only half their tail? And at first I thought maybe what was happening is that if the male spread both sides of his tail, you could get acoustic interference of one side of the tail with the other, that they could actually cancel each other out and make for a complicated interference pattern. And so I had Emily go and measure uh, the tail feathers in the wind tunnel and try to produce inter interference by moving the feathers around. And that was an example of an experiment that did not work. Uh, she was never able to replicate that effect. Uh, and and this, this was one of those moments where, you know, as the professor, you decide, oh wait, okay, maybe she's doing something wrong. So I went and tried it and I got the exact same result that she did. I, I, need, to, I need to trust my, uh, the people in my lab. Um, it turned, what I had been assuming is that when the feathers are vibrating, that they're vibrating coherently, but we did some, some additional measurements and figured out, oh, actually they're not coherent sound sources. Um, and so we can throw out the acoustic interference hypothesis. So my current working hypothesis is, is that instead uh, the, the tail is under some sort of anatomical constraint. So when they spread the, when they twist the tail, they twist it below their body. It might simply be that they can't also twist their tail above their body. And so they're limited in, in what they can do. And so maybe the reason why they only spread half their tail is because they can only twist, twist their tail in one direction. Okay. So as I said earlier, I don't actually know what explains this match between the song and the dive sound of Costa's Hummingbird. But at this point, I can say a number of things about it. So the song, songs, because songs are socially learned, they probably evolve quickly and uh, has evolved this specific structure very specifically. And then for the dive sound, the dive sound is made by the tail feathers as the male swoops at high speed over the, or past the female. And the, and the strategy that this species employs of diving off the female side is unique, and it modulates how the female hears the Doppler effect as the male dives on past her. So as I said before, to well, I don't have an answer to this question of, of why they do it. Um, what I would really like to do is test female ears and female hearing and get a better idea of how the female herself actually experiences a male when he displays, because Ultimately, the reason why the male is performing these courtship displays is to appeal to female preferences. And so something about female preferences uh, is presumably the, the answer to why we have this funny match between the song and the dive sound. Okay, so with the 
time that I have left, I'm going to switch gears. Uh, I just so the the stuff that I just told you about was a paper that I published in the journal Current Biology a couple of years ago, along with Emily. Um, but it's one project of a whole bunch that I've been working on on um, a whole or a number of different species within this entire group of hummingbirds. So this is a kind of a family tree of the group. And th these are a bunch of line drawings of different species of hummingbird. And you can see that th these are all males. You can see that we've got species uh, with really narrow tail feathers or tapered tail feathers or long tail feathers that basically the, the tail is, is under diversifying selection and every single species in this group looks different from every other. Uh, and it turns out that's because almost all these guys are producing sounds with their tail feathers. So here's a volcano hummingbird from Costa Rica. So that ooh -ee -oo sound during the dive, that's actually vocal, but in the middle there's an eh, 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 and that's made with the tapered tip of this feather right here, R2. So I'll play that again. Eh, 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 is the tail feather sound. Here's the purple-throated woodstar from Colombia. So again, he's making sound in two different ways. He's making kind of a ah, sound with his tail feathers. And there's also a, a snap, a snap in the middle. And I'm not, I, my best guess is that the snapping sound is made with the wings. Here's Alan's hummingbird. This is a species that I have uh, in, in Riverside. That was, that was the sound the male makes when he dives. I'll play that again. And that's being made, that sound is actually made by two of these tail feathers interacting. It's both this feather R3 and also this feather R4 that produce different parts of that sound. Here's Calliope hummingbird, another species from the US and Canada. So what's happening there is there's, there's a high pitched sound that, mm, that's kind of faint. That I, I think is vocal. And there's also at the beginning of the recording, there's a bzz sound that's made with the tail feathers. Uh, I'll play this black chin on a later slide. Here's another one. This is the, the uh, white bellied wood star. So that sound is made by these really narrow, thin tail feathers that they have. There's also another, I'll play it again. There's also another bird calling in the foreground. Let's see. So I, I assume many of you are from Texas. So I thought I would focus uh, in talking about some of the other species of hummingbird and what they do. I, I, I thought I would focus on Texas species specifically. So this is black chin hummingbird. It's uh, um, one of the most abundant species of hummingbird in, in North America, north of Mexico. And uh, it is found in riparian areas, especially in association with sycamores uh, throughout kind of the, the mountain west. And what these guys have, their outer tail feathers, uh, R5, have this tapered tip. And what I figured out with a, an undergraduate uh, at this point uh, a number of years ago, is that it's this tip of R5 that produces the sound that they make when they dive. Because we did some experiments, if you cut off just the distant, distal six uh, millimeters of the tail feather, the sound that they make goes away. And if you take a, take a wild male and you cut all the barbs off this feather except for the final six millimeters, this, this manipulation, this male can still make the sound that they make when they dive. So what these guys do, I'll play the sound first. So what these guys do, the boop, 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 kind of the bell-like sound, that's the male spreading and shutting his tail multiple times and making a boop, 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 a pulse of sound each time he spreads his tail. And then the buzzing sound in that is actually made by the wings. So again, I'll play that again. So the bzz, bzz sound, that's, that's made by the wings. Uh, and then here's here's a recording of a shuttle. So this is a dive where the male's diving at high speed over the over the female. The shuttle display, the male simply flies back and forth in front of her and just makes wing sounds. Okay, when I uh, studied black chin hummingbirds, I tried to get a bunch of my own high speed videos of them. But then I went on YouTube and found this high speed video again from about a decade ago. This video was better than any of the ones that I'd ever taken. Um, so the male black chin hummingbird, yeah, so there he is. He's flapping his wings and you'll see in just a moment, he'll, okay, he spreads his tail there, spreads it again there, spreads his tail there. So he's making a pulse of sound each time he spreads his wings and, or he spreads his tail. And notice that he's flapping, his, he's barely flapping his wings when he spreads his tail and then he flaps his wings really hard to make another wing sound. 
Okay, the sister species to black chain hummingbird is ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, and its courtship displays are pretty similar to black chain hummingbird. These, are, these two species are, are close relatives. Uh, so I don't have good videos of their dives, but here's a shuttle display. So, and I'll play this high-speed video first. So what this is, this is a stuffed mount of an anise hummingbird, and I put the anise hummingbird onto this guy's feeder. Uh, and so he's come up and doesn't know what to make of it, and so he's doing a courtship display. Where he's going to fly back and forth, making sounds with his wings. And you can see he's got his gorget, his, his gorget spread. He's, he's trying to impress her. And I'm going to play a sound recording that's not synced to the video. So it's you know, flying back and forth, making those clicking sounds with his wings. OK, this was a really fun bird. Uh, when I went to Texas to record Lucifer hummingbirds, uh, I um, I got in touch with Kelly Bryant, who, of course, used to live in the Davis Mountains. And he had this particular bird that was coming to, and living at his feeders in the Davis Mountains. Uh, and this is not a black chin hummingbird, and it's not a broad-tailed hummingbird. Rather, this is a hybrid between the two species. Uh, and so Ke uh, Kelly invited me to come and try to get recordings of its displays. And I was, I was very glad to, because uh, hummingbirds, uh, the different species do different displays. And so seeing what a hybrid would do was, was fascinating. So here's that same stuffed female. Here's this hybrid. Uh, it's played back at a different speed, but basically here's the male doing a shuttle display, flying back and forth, uh, trying to show off to her. And here's the sound that he was making with his wings when he shuttled. Flying back and forth very vigorously. So we also got sound recordings of his dive. We didn't get any good video. Um, so this is the sound that, that black chin hummingbird makes when it dives. So there's a series of pulses of sound, this boop, 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 boop sound that I played a bit ago. Here's the sound that broad-tailed hummingbird makes when it dives. So it's mostly a, a wing trill, but there's this ink, ink, ink in the middle. That's the male spreading his tail three quick times in succession. And here's what the hybrid did. So you can see that the hybrid spread his tail more than three times. He has you know, about, about six or seven pulses of sound, but he didn't spread it as, as many times as black chinned. Um, also, it's kind of hard to tell in the recording, but this is a really faint sound. Like, and, and also, so he's making some wing trill up here, but his wing trill is also faint. So what turned out was happening, oh yeah, and, I can, and I'll point out some other features. So black chin hummingbird, of course, is named for this large black patch on their chin and then a, a thin strip of purple feathers underneath. Broad-tailed hummingbird doesn't have any black chin at all. It's in a different genus. It just has these uh, uh, dark pink feathers on its throat. And so this hybrid is, is intermediate between the two. You can see the shade of pink sort of looks like it's in between this purple and this uh, dark pink. And he's got a small uh, dark patch on his throat, but it's not quite black. It's more kind of dark, but with a little bit of flecked with green. So this is pretty common where uh, when you mix two species together, you get a hybrid that's intermediate between the two. And that happens when the traits that you're looking at are under the, the control of many different genes, such that blending genes from one individual and, and of one species and blending in genes from an individual of another species produces a hybrid that's, that's halfway in between the two. So what was really fun about these guys is that black chin hummingbird is making its dive sound with R5, broad-tailed hummingbird is making its dive sound with R2, and uh, when we took some of this hybrid's tail feathers and tested them in the wind tunnel, we could get R5 to make the same sound as he made when he dove. So even though his tail feathers in shape were kind of intermediate between black chin and broad-tailed, uh, the mechanism by which they made sound still matched one parent species more so than the other. So their wings also make sound, um, and black chin hummingbirds have this kind of rounded outer wing feather, uh, distinctively rounded. Um, and when we wrote this paper, there's feathers that are not shown here that are on the kind of interior of the wing that we thought were the ones that make their wing trill. Turns out that's probably not the case. Um, but anyway, broad-tailed hummingbird makes sound with this outer wing feather right here, which is really narrow and it actually twists or uh, curves out slightly. 
And so here's the P10 of the, this hybrid, which is intermediate in shape between this curved, you know, down-curved uh, P10 of Blackton hummingbird and this outward recurved P10 of broad-tailed hummingbird. And our, we, we, because we, we let them go, we didn't, we didn't keep them or anything, uh, we didn't have a chance to take any wing feathers and test their wing feathers in the wind tunnel. But we think what's happening is that when, when the hybrid was flying around, he was producing sound with P10. Uh, matching the mechanism that broad-tailed makes its wing trill with and not black chain hummingbird. I think I'm going to skip over that slide. Uh, that was basically more of the mechanism. So the, the, the point uh, is, is that uh, hummingbirds sometimes make hybrids, and the hybrids, uh, when you see them, they, they are kind of a fun mix of the characters of their, of their parent species. Okay, so the reason why I came to Texas to do that field work was to see this species, Lucifer hummingbird. And of course, Lucifer is predominantly a Mexican species, uh, but the biggest uh, population of them in the US is in Big Bend uh, National Park, as well as some locations outside of Big Bend, but kind of in, in that part of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the desert. And what's, so when I set out to find them, what I knew is that people, previous ornithologists had studied them in Big Bend National Park. And there were these drawings like this one in uh, old books. This is showing a, a male coming up and doing a shuttle display to a female on a nest, then ascending for a dive, kind of following this wavering trajectory, then reaching the apex and then diving past her and diving um, off into the distance. And so when I set out to study these guys, this was kind of weird. Why, why would a male do a display to a female that already has eggs? And yet it turns out that's several species of hummingbird do that. And it's, it's really not clear why that is. Anyway, when I do these trips to, to places I've never been before, it's kind of a scavenger hunt to show up someplace and then poke around until I find the birds that I'm after. And in the case of Lucifer hummingbird, we spent several days driving around Big Bend National Park, having just very little luck. Um, and then I, fi I finally tried the, the tried and two trick of going exactly where the previous person had studied them, where they had gone. So Peter Scott had studied these guys in Big Bend in the 1980s. He was a, uh, a ranger at Big Bend National Park for a couple of years. And so in his time as a ranger, he figured out exactly where to go. Um, and so when I made my way up Panther Canyon, which is part of the park that's off limits to the public, but the, the rangers were nice enough to let me go there. When I came around the corner and came across this slick rock part of the canyon, suddenly there were Lucifer hummingbirds all over the place. And specifically, there were females building and uh, nests and incubating eggs. And it was, it was like every hundred meters going up this slick rock, there, you'd spot another female, spot another female. So I had a, a photographer friend along with me. And uh, so hummingbirds usually hide their nests, but Lucifer hummingbirds instead put their nests out in the open, uh, such as on this choya. And so we, by accident, we found this female and saw her building this particular nest. And uh, because the males often come up to nests to display to nesting females, and this female was building a nest and therefore we need to mate soon, we thought maybe a male would come up and, and court her. So Anand was sitting there watching this female and he saw her do this. And she's, you know, she's got kind of this uncomfortable look on her face. And instead of being down in the nest, which like she normally would be when she's making it, she was instead perched on the side of the nest. And also this nest is about three feet off the ground. So it's really easy for a person to walk up and look into it. And we knew that there was not an egg inside the nest uh, beforehand. So anyway, she did this and then she flew off and he went over and looked in the nest and sure enough, there was an egg inside. So this is a picture of a female, a wild female lucifer hummingbird laying an egg in a nest. Um, here's a, a video of, of their shuttle display. So again, high-speed videos usually don't have sound. So you can see he's got his, his gorget flared like a, like a um, you know, eight or 10 legged octopus. Um, and then here's a sound recording of what they sound like when they shuttle. So that's yet another type of sound that the birds are making with their wings. Uh, in the case of species like Lucifer hummingbird, I have no idea how that particular sound is made. All right, well, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, yeah, so that has been a bit on, on the littlest birds and how they produce sounds with their feathers as well as how they sing. Uh, for those of you that, are, that find this interesting, I've started putting all of the talks that I give like this one uh, up onto my YouTube channel, uh, which it, it occurs to me, I should put up a link here um, 
But at any rate, if you uh, do a, a Google search for animal aeroacoustics, uh, or you search my name, which is Chris Clark, I'm an associate professor at uh, UC Riverside, uh, finding my YouTube channel should not be too difficult. Uh, and so I've got a number of videos that I've, that I've made. Some of the videos are for other scientists to see how many record trip displays. Uh, but I know that the public finds this stuff really engaging as well. Uh, and so for anybody that wants to know more about how hummingbirds perform their displays, I encourage you to come check out my YouTube channel. Uh, and with that, uh, I have done this work uh, with the generous support from the National Science Foundation. Uh, when I was a, a postdoc, which is when some of these data were collected, I, back then I worked at the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies. Uh, and another funder that we had, the Sea and Sage Audubon Society, uh, generously gave uh, Katie some grant funding for her work on song learning and cost of hummingbirds. So since this is normally I give a talk like this live and would answer questions, but uh, since I'm pre-recording this for the Davis Mountains um, Hummingbird Festival, uh, with that, uh, if you have any questions for me, um, I, I get I, people email with me with hummingbird questions all the time. Uh, my email address is pretty easy to find on the UCR website. Uh, so by all means, uh, yeah, I encourage you if you want to know more about hummingbirds, uh, shoot me an email. <laughs>